by interesting, I mean, we're going to find out everyone together what, what we're going to be seeing. But we're going to have Julian play against Phil Gallagher. Now, if you know in the chat, if you're familiar with Julian, if you're familiar with Phil, they're kind of one-trick ponies when you when you really think about it. When you look at Julian, you, you think about Mill. And I got to tell you, this <laughs> Mill deck looks great. I've never seen him play oh any gosh. other Mill deck in my life. He's the Mill king, they would say. I've never seen Julian play anything else. And this is a really interesting deck here. And I like that he has four main deck surgicals. He's really, really <laughs> going after somebody. Had Emrakul. He's ready. Jody, can you ever beat this deck? Man, this is a deck right here. It looks like uh, a bunch of one drops. Most of them are blue. And then we got this surgical. Yeah, I can read it. Glimpse the Unthinkable, Archive Trap, Brain Freeze. All right, this thing is wow. So This is a they- wild deck. <laughs> but... <laughs> That's just a joke. Uh, Julian is literally a one-trick pony. Oh, this man, man can only play some elves, and that is what we are going to see Julian Nab submit for the Legacy Premier League. And I got to tell you, this is not very surprising. But I, I got to tell you, this deck looks pretty good. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Julian stream, uh, but he plays this deck a lot. And I got to tell you, if there's somebody who really knows how to play this kind of deck... Julian knows it very well. He knows his deck inside and out. He knows what he wants to do in all his matchups. And we've certainly seen Julian play some really interesting uh, variations of the deck. And, you know, the plans that he has sometimes are not combo plans. They're a lot of fair plans. And we see here that he has, you know, another really fair plan post-board. You know, cards like Lost Legacy and Thoughtseize. Um, Deck looks great. And, and I'm really excited to see, uh, you know, how he's going to play. You know, and Julian has to be really happy seeing uh, seeing uh, Malamujo load up death and taxes. You know, you got to be happy about that one. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, that's definitely going to be a favorable matchup for Elves. Uh, one noticeable thing, he's just down to business, focused on his combo. You said he's got a lot of fair things, but he doesn't have, like, the weird uh, green creatures that you can normally uh, natural order for in the sideboard. Um, I don't think he needs them in, in this match for sure. But you know, what's the what's the new uh, commander? Uh, the the new card that they they printed the natural order out, and you uh, choose a uh, card type, and players can't play it. That was one. Oh, I, was I haven't seen that one, but that one it. that one's really exciting. I don't know if that's on Moto just yet, but uh, I mean, on the other side of the bracket, uh, Phil Gallagher loading up Death and Taxes. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is really this is really interesting here. Uh, you know, this is the kind of uh, this is the kind of matchup that that if Julian had to kind of pick his dream scenario, he would have a bunch of death and taxes decks <laughs> in uh, uh, available. We see here that uh, Phil is not really doing anything super exciting. He's playing something very clean, and this is what I really like about death and taxes. Death and taxes is a very clean, clean deck. Uh, it kind of does the same thing over and over again. All of its cards are very similar. Uh, and we see here Brightling, and Brightling is really starting to pick up in popularity. And and I got to tell you, Jody, I think Brightling is a house. I think oh, it's, it's a house. And I think yeah. it, I think it might have... I mean, like, obviously with Death uh, death Rights banning, Death uh, death and Taxes kind of jumped up a little bit, right? But Brightling really makes this deck sing, I think. Yeah, I've seen it play a few times over the last few weeks, and it looks like the white true name nemesis, for sure. You know, it's really hard to remove. Uh, you can bounce it back to your hand, especially if you have a vile set on three. And it, it goes unstop- unstoppable in a lot of games from what I've seen. Yeah, and we see here post board, Phil has another bright lane. You know, he he really has seen the power of this card, and he really wants to go ahead and make use out of it. And I'm I'm really excited. I'm really excited to see this matchup. Um, I mean, again, this is very favorable for elves. He has to he has to feel great. Julian has to feel great right now. So I, I I'm interested to see though. But we do know we've seen it happen before. We'll see it happen again. Uh, Death and Taxes has all the abilities to win. Yeah, you can't ever count it out, Rudy. That's for sure. No, not not at all. And no, uh, especially with the inclusion of the snow covered plains, you really really can't discount. And it's actually Texas. really Let's... interesting. Do do you actually know why Death of Texas started playing <laughs> planes and snow covered planes? I, I'm sure that number might not be exactly correct. Six planes and seven snow covered planes. I'm sure we'll get. Uh, an idea, but but that's actually why is a uh, is uh, Mike is showing us. Huh? 
It's actually just for Predict. Uh, something that, uh, if you're in the chat, Anzi104 actually kind of popularized Predict in Miracles as a way to kind of gain advantage. And it became this kind of turbo Xerox deck, you know, four Ponder, four Brainstorm, three Predict, and they just kind of shuffled through their entire deck. And this part of what made Miracles so good as it was, and, and adding Predict just gave it like another set of cards to kind of just flip through. And uh, you see a lot of Death and Taxes that kind of switch between planes and snow-covered planes. Um, to uh, <laughs> you, you know, to kind of be able to beat predict because if the one thing you're going to name right is probably going to be planes and being able to just kind of flip that gives you like a very minor percentage, but it's something that is pretty reasonable to have. Yeah, it's definitely worth noting. Uh, I've noticed that playing some lands list of mine, you spread out the uh, fetch lands to go one one and one. Um, it's just something you should do, you know, if you have if given the opportunity. Yeah, and uh, we see here, I, I assume we're going to start in, in just a moment here. We're going to see opening hands here, and i got to tell you, both of these hands look pretty good for both players. This is almost everything you want out of out of both decks, right? Yeah, the only thing you're really missing from Death and Taxes is, is probably Aether Vial, Either you know, well, out of this sure. hand. Yeah. yeah, and if we look at the Elves' hand, we have the Cradle, we have the Land of War Elves, the Ranger... The um, Wirewood Symbiote accommodation with the Visionary should be good to set up to get more card advantage throughout the game. So, uh, looks like Death of Texas leads off on the with the Snow Covered Plains. And Elves, it looks like Julian picks up a, a Glimpse. Definitely oh, a good draw. Glimpse. Glimpse has to be incredible for here. Uh, we do have Land War Elves, Quarian Ranger, and Wirewood Symbiote. So, it's quite a few ways uh, to be able to kind of bounce and, and replay a lot of creatures, really gain a lot of value out of Glimpse. And I think this is also one of the matchups where just being a value Glimpse of nature is probably good enough. Now, why would you, uh, can you explain why Julian would lead with the Quarian Ranger over the Land War Elves in this spot? Um, it looks here like. Uh, it's possible that guy. Oh, see, Gaia's Cradle is just such a powerful card that it might be that uh, you know he's really wanting to you know be able to leverage the forest or be able to you know fetch for a Dryad Arbor during the end step and be able to protect it from a Wasteland or a Plow. Um, okay. I'm not really super familiar with with one over the other, um, but I, I personally lead off with Land or else. But if there's someone who knows what they're doing with this deck, it's probably Julian. So oh I, yeah, oh yeah. No, I just. Stuff. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I haven't played too much Elves, so I was just interested. Okay, so Drew Swords, different art whenever they cast it. It's interesting how it works. <laughs> yeah, and so, this is, so they, yeah that, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> this is definitely not a good draw for Philip catching the Batter Skull that he would presumably uh, otherwise want to go get with the second Stoneforge. And we're going to see here, we're probably going to see an Umazawa's Jit here off of the Stoneforge Mystic. Certainly one of the most powerful cards against a slew of, of X1s here. And uh, I, I can't imagine that, you know, Phil's too unexcited about having Mirror and Crusader in his hand as well to potentially pair with it. Okay, so it looks like this is going to be a fetch for the Dry Arbor play like you were talking about to power up that Cradle. Yeah, this is going to be great, and uh, we're, we're probably going to see here Glimpse of Nature just to draw a, a couple cards. Um, again, as I said, this is a this is a matchup where you honestly don't mind just drawing, you know, three or four cards. It's probably going to be more than good enough to to really bury death and taxes. Green Sun gets the uh, Heritage Druid to keep the mana gut flowing. Looks like we'll probably see a bounce on that Visionary and a recast. Yeah, we're, we're going to see uh, this Glimpse of Nature plus Elvish Visionary has to feel absolutely wonderful. And with another Heritage Druid here, uh, Jody could theoretically, if he had more creatures... You know, keep going, but unfortunately, his hand is kind of lands in natural order, so he's just gonna have to wait till next turn. And uh, Phil is in this weird spot where he doesn't really have you know many many things to do. He just kind of has to hope that this uh, jet is gonna get here. But uh, I think this hard cast crater hoof behemoth is gonna yeah. probably be probably be more than enough. I think we can actually uh, natural order as well afterwards for a second one. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I think the one crater hub is going to be more than good enough. But <laughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and see. We're gonna see uh, Julian clean up game one. We're gonna go on to sideboarding. What do you like here for death and taxes? For death and taxes, you definitely want the more add more removal to your deck via path to exile. Uh, Brightling, I'm not sure how it fits in this matchup. Uh, it looks a little expensive to me. Um, it's a tough match. I would probably say value is not that good, given that there's so many creatures and mana accessible to the elf deck, so that would be the first thing to cut out. Um, it looks like uh, Philip's just a little light in this match. Uh, I don't know what, what more you can do, uh, other than get as much removal as you can, and then trying... Uh, I guess the game plan would be you know, to try and get that uh, Stoneforge down, disrupt with a uh, cheap one mana removal, and then try and get that GTA going. So yeah, for sure. Uh, for what sure, about Jul? Sure. What about Julian here? I look like Julian Jul- Scavenging News. Yeah, he's he's taking out you know Glimpse of Nature, Scavenging News, some of the uh, you know smaller mana creatures. And instead, he's going to have some flexible sideboard cards. We're going to see Abrupt Decay. We're going to see Piffy Needle. These cards are going to be really good against uh, you know the real problematic things that Phil is going to present. Cards like Phyrexian Revoker, Umazawa's Jitte, uh, Sanctum Prelate, Spirit of the Labyrinth. These are all cards that are going to, in general, line up pretty well against what Julian's trying to do. So he's going to want to be able to to be proactive with Pithy Needle or be able to use Abrupt Decay as a way to kind of just take care of everything. Um, you know, I can't really see, you know, not wanting anything else. It's possible that Thoughtseize might be okay, but but probably not. Reclamation Sage, Decay, and Pithy Needle probably more than good enough to, to be able to have good answers to what Phil is trying to do. Um, you know, on Phil's side, you know, it's, it's as you said, he just doesn't really have a lot for this matchup here. Um, the only thing I am a little interested about is uh, I believe Remorseful Cleric is the new spirit, uh, the new one in a white two one that you can sacrifice to exile target opponent's graveyard. That's right. Yeah, I- I'm kind of interested that Phil isn't keeping in the second one. And the reason that I say that is because but there's something that is relevant in this matchup. It's flying. And being able to just have a two mana cheap flyer is probably something that you don't mind having in your deck. Uh, you know, part of the ways that the elves deck really beats Umazawa's Jit on the field is by using Symbiote and using Quirion Ranger <clears throat> as a way to you know block and bounce. Uh, you know, to really prevent Jit from getting going. So having a flyer in play means that if he, fl- uh, you know, Julian misses on a Sage or a Decay or a Needle. Phil can really use Jet as a way to take over the game at that point. That's reasonable, but Philip does uh, still have the the mother runes. It seems like there wasn't much to bring in. Uh, I mean, everything else seems like something that that he would want in his deck. But that is a good point because you have to go unblockable. So keep keeping the extra flyers does seem reasonable. So you can connect with your GT, which has got to be Philip's number one plan in this match. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, we're going to see them here. What I also like Phil's doing, and this is something that I think maybe doesn't happen uh, potentially enough, especially in a format like Legacy, is we see Phil board out of land here. Now, Jody, talk to me for a little bit. Why would you want to board out of land? Why would you want to board out of land? <laughs> that sounds like a loaded question. The uh, I, I feel like for his deck, you, maybe you, you assume that your either vols are going to be pretty safe and that the game's not really going to go that long. So you would need more interaction uh, early. That would be one reason. Uh, the deck can operate off of just two lands, playing the GTA and equipping it as the plan. So maybe didn't really want to cut anything else. I mean, you saw what was left in the deck. Cut the Brightling. Left in the... Uh, it, I had to cut one of the Remorseful Clerics already. So I, land seems... Pretty reasonable. It looks like he's going to get punished for this with this uh, either ball getting blown up right here, though. That interaction is uh, that Julian has put in coming in right there. It looks like it's going to slow down, fill up a good bit. Yeah, for absolutely. And I think that's uh, something that Julian really wants to do if he's you know not really progressing his board is slow down, fill as much as possible here. But uh, I like this. I like Recruiter of the Guard. What 
uh, what would you want to get if you played recruiter here? And it, that's actually really interesting here is that we saw Phil use Wasteland uh, because he re- it looks like he's very much valuing the Stoneforge Mystic JIT uh, in keeping his opponent down rather than playing something like Recruiter of the Guard. Right. Well, it definitely looks like he's trying to punish Julian for firing off that abrupt decay early on the either vial. This might be a good window. Maybe maybe he thinks Julian doesn't have much interaction and might have used the, uh, his only source of interaction on that either vol. So it might have been a green light. Yeah, definitely a, a way to kind of make way to ensure the Stoneforge Mystic is able to kind of potentially get in uh, with the Umazawa's Jeet here. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and, and see, uh, interestingly enough, Julian's just going to kind of make his board go wide and, and put a Wirewood Symbiote into play here. And, and Wirewood Symbiote, you know, as we kind of talked about during sideboarding, is one of those really good cards against, you know, the, the Umazawa plan. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like you mentioned, uh, having an invasive creature or mother runes or something to connect with that GTA is uh, very important. And that Wirewood Symbiote looks like it's going to stymie the main game plan of this GTA. But... Yeah. Philip did draw Mother Rooms last turn, so it'll be interesting to see how this one plays out, if he can get this GTA to connect before Julian can develop a big enough plan here. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it looks here like he's just going to kind of force the action uh, on on Julian here. You know, Julian's going to bounce this Elvish Visionary with Wirewood Symbiote regardless of what happens, so it makes the most amount of sense to just kind of press the action and, and force your opponent to to maybe make the play on your terms instead of theirs. Uh, but this Mother of Runes is definitely providing a fantastic way to, to be able to win the game here. Although, what's kind of interesting um, is I have to I have to check here. Uh, I don't believe we saw Julian boarded boarded in, but I do believe uh, oh he doesn't have one. Um, what's really interesting here is a lot of these Elves decks we've seen in the past play a card like Progenitus. <laughs> we kind of see Julian without one here. Oh yeah, I mentioned that in the sideboard. Usually you see some kind of big green creature to board in. Um, looks like he for, for uh, he got he decided to go with more interactive elements and thought sees the extra discard and the extra removal. Those Pithing Needles... On top of that, I mean, he has a lot of interaction for this match, but he definitely doesn't have the over-the-top to make his natural order that much stronger. No, cer- certainly not here, but that is that is kind of I- interesting because that's something that I'm I'm normally expecting to see is something like that here. Wow, this is a this is a very next <laughs> next level play. <laughs> is we're we're gonna morph, we're gonna play a morph here morph. Very good against Mother of Runes. Yeah, Julian comes out with the secret creature to defend against the Mother Runes to at least force a trade with the Stoneforge Mystic. Will lose some part of his board in the process because the. Oh, actually, uh, does he have a mana to unmorph the thing? No. If, uh, see, yeah. that would be great if Julian had one more mana or uh, another elf to to get one mana. Uh, then he could actually block, unmorph it, and then bounce it with the symbiote to deny counters yet again. That <laughs> would be that's a that's a really next level play here. Um, you know, if you're Phil, what do you think this morph is? You know, could be anything, yeah. right? The not the not so secret secret creature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's definitely one of the one of those things that you see somebody play, and you're like, where did you get a morph? <laughs> So we will see the GTA get counters here. <clears throat> uh, we got to imagine that he's going to start going after this Wirewood symbiote. I, I think Phil's plan here is just kind of keep the board as clean as possible and just hope your opponent doesn't have Progenitus in their deck. Well, it's interesting here because this natural order at some point is getting close to being lethal with a greater hoof. I mean, we, we do have four creatures in play. If we can get, uh, if Julian gets a fetch land for a Dryad Arbor or something like that, that could p- potentially put a big clock on Philip. That could just be insurmountable for even a GTA. Like a 5-5 a five five is a big body against a creature with no uh, uh, GTA counters. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Just being able to kind of block and, and do like a mini attack, uh, especially if, uh, Julian kept in both his crater hoofs. It's entirely possible that he's going to just kind of be able to jump 
back in just like here's a five five attack you you know for seven or eight untap play you know natural order again get another crater hoof attack you uh, you know for 12 that might just be something that is more than good enough to to be able to just kind of overwhelm the overwhelm phil's board presence I think I think here we actually might see that we actually might see this natural order to go and get either a reclamation sage for for the equipment or we might see a crater hoof behemoth here and uh, we'll we'll see in a moment what Julian's plan is here but I, I honestly wouldn't fault him if he went either way right no I could go either way right here so what is this yeah. oh is this my, lethal here? my apologies that's actually uh, it's actually nineteen. Uh, right here, I believe. Or actually, is it twenty? No, no, no. It's definitely more than twenty-four. It's twenty-three, 24. It's 23 <laughs> yeah, after the trample. Yeah. So we're going to see Julian win. <laughs> <laughs> we're wow. we're so focused on trying to figure out. Oh, what what can Phil do to get out of this? What is Julian going to do to beat this equipment? And Julian just goes ahead, turns all his creatures sideways, and he's going to take this match two zero over uh, over Phil Gallagher here. And I, I got to tell you, I'm not really too surprised at this outcome. No, that was very masterful play on the, uh, like you said, it's hard to see the morph on the wirewood, uh, I mean, the morph out there on the Birch Lure Rangers to be able to keep an extra creature in play to line up that play, uh, forcing the, the GTA and the Mother Runes to, to all get used on on uh, Phillip's turn. It was a good play by Julian, for sure. You could definitely tell that he's a master of the deck. Yeah, for sure, and and obviously we we kind of missed <laughs> missed the very obvious play, but uh, I I think that's mostly fine. But that that was kind of exciting. So Jody, uh, looks like you know who you're going to be playing against. You're going to be playing against Julian. How do you feel about this matchup? Ooh, well, I mean, it can get you out of anywhere, but I, I definitely like playing effectively four rats in my deck. When you talk about engineering explosives and supreme verdict, uh, plus all the swords, I have a lot of removal. And the standstills are easy to get down if you clear the board. Um, I, I, I like the matchup. I've only played it a few times. You don't see many elves matchups right now. So uh, I like where, where the match is for sure. Interesting. Well, good luck to you, Jody. Uh, we're going to see uh, next. I, I think we're actually going to see you play against Julian. And then after that, we're going to see Phil play against Malamujo in a Death and Taxes mirror. And that will actually be definitely uh, very actually kind of interesting. It might be it might be a little slow, it might be a little slow, but uh, it'll definitely be it'll definitely be really interesting. But uh, I, I think we're gonna go ahead and take a break, move on to commercials, uh, and then we're gonna come back in a little bit with Jody versus Julian. Oh yeah, we'll see y'all back in a bit. Yep. Good luck, Jody. <laughs> 